Welcome back to Crown on Canvas, the tutors in art and history. In this season of Accessible Art History, the podcast, we're using portraits to explore the magnificent and sometimes maligned Tudor dynasty. From Henry VII to Elizabeth I, this family ruled England for 118 years. And don't forget, the six wives of Henry VIII will cover them too. Each episode has an accompanying blog post, so make sure to check it out using the link in the show notes. We can't wait to go on this exciting art historical journey with you. Welcome back to Crown on Canvas. The last episode ended with Henry Tudor gearing up to invade England and take the throne away from the generally hated Richard III. A bit of a spoiler alert, though you could probably tell by the title of this podcast season, is that Henry found victory in the battlefield and was crowned the first king of the Tudor dynasty. In this episode, I'll explore his reign and some key events that would drive the history of this illustrious family. So to learn more keep on listening. As with every episode of this podcast, I will showcase a portrait of the ruler to give us an idea about what they looked like and how they wanted to be seen by their people. Today's portrait dates from 1505, towards the end of Henry VII's reign. According to the National Portrait Gallery, it's the oldest painting in their collection. It's a bust-length portrait, meaning it only shows a sitter from the chest up. In this work, Henry is seated with his hands resting on a ledge. It's a fascinating detail because it appears that he is coming out of the painting and into the viewer's space. He's wearing clothes fit for a king, including a magnificently embroidered coat and a heavy golden chain. However, despite these details, the viewers can still see Henry's age. His cheeks are slightly sunken in and his hair has become gray. But this is hardly surprising. Henry was 48 at the time his portrait was painted, and he had spent the last 20 years trying to consolidate his power. However, he does remind viewers that it was the Red Rose of Lancaster that was victorious by holding a flower in his hand. Art historians believe that this was the portrait that Henry VII sent to Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian I. Sadly, he sent this painting because his wife had died in childbirth and he was hoping to make a marital alliance with the Holy Roman Empire via Maximilian's daughter, Margaret of Savoy. But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Let's rewind and go back to August 22nd, 1485. This day was a pivotal moment in the War of the Roses and is often considered the last major battle of the conflict. The battle unfolded near Market Bosworth in Leicestershire, England, with a marshy terrain playing a role in shaping the tactics employed by both sides. The Yorkist forces, led by King Richard III, had an estimated 7,500 to 12,000 men, while the Lancastrians, led by Henry Tudor, had between 5 and 8,000 men. The Yorks held the advantage of a larger army and the high ground, positioning themselves on the top of a hill. However, because of the marshy terrain, victory was less certain. Eventually, the Lancastrian forces found a dry area from which to take their stand. Despite their superior numbers and equipment, this caused the Yorkist soldiers to panic. Richard III decided the only way he could win this battle was to face Henry one-on-one. So he and a small number of his force rode down to meet the would-be usurper. Immediately, Henry Loyal's followers surrounded him and made it near impossible for Richard III to attack. At this crucial moment, a nobleman named Stanley defected and joined the Lancastrian forces. This spelled the beginning of the end. Richard III was knocked from his horse and was beaten to death by numerous soldiers. In fact, when his skeleton's remains were discovered in 2012, anthropologists found 11 separate wounds on his head, including one that cut part of his skull off. With their leader dead, the Yorkist forces retreated. Stanley, the man who betrayed Richard III, found his crown on the battlefield and gave it to Henry Tudor, declaring him King of England. Although Henry was a fourth-generation descendant of Edward III, most historians mark his reign as being won in combat versus descent. The Battle of Bosworth Field marked the end of the War of the Roses as far as military engagements go but there was still work to be done in the political arena. Next, we're gonna discuss Henry VII's reign, but first, let's take a quick break. Hi there, my name is Annalisa, and I'm the founder of Accessible Art History. My goal is to bring art history content to anyone that's curious. All my platforms can be accessed for free, but there are ways you can support my cause. If you enjoy this episode, please consider leaving a rate and review on your favorite platform. I also have a Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee account set up if you feel inclined to support accessible art history monetarily. However, I commit to always bringing my work for free because I believe that education should be accessible for those who want and need it. Thank you for listening to today's episode and keep an eye out for more art history content from Accessible Art History. All right, now that we're back, let's dive into Henry's reign. Almost immediately, he had to consolidate power. His first move was to date his reign to the day before the Battle of Bosworth Field. This way, anyone who fought on the Yorker side would be considered a traitor to the crown. It also allowed him to confiscate the lands owned by Richard III and restore his own lands that were taken during the reign of Edward IV. 
However, in a smart political move, Henry allowed people to swear their loyalty to the new Tudor regime and therefore maintain a hold on their own titles. Another important political move that Henry did was to keep his promise to wed Elizabeth of York, the oldest child of Edward IV. First, he restored her and her sister's legitimacy to ensure that any children born of this union would have a claim to the throne through both their Yorkist mother's line and his Lancastrian line. The couple was wed in 1486, and a new emblem, the Tudor Rose, was created to symbolize their line. It combines the Red Rose of Lancaster and the White Rose of York into a single flower. Henry VII implemented various economic policies. Um, Henry VII implemented various economic policies aimed at stabilizing the kingdom's finances. After decades of war and strife, the treasury was in dire need of funds. He introduced a system of fiscal administration, which included the establishment of the Court of the Star Chamber to hear cases of financial misconduct. He also increased royal revenues through strict financial management. Under Henry's rule, England prospered financially. He made smart trade alliances, especially in industries connected with the wool business, which helped boost the economy to the pre-War of the Roses level. The king was also determined to avoid more costly wars with foreign powers. Now that England was stable, Henry VII could look for ways to ally himself with other nations in Europe. Famously, he was one of the first monarchs to recognize the United Kingdom of Spain under King Ferdinand of Aragon and Queen Isabella of Castile. He betrothed his son Arthur to the couple's youngest daughter, Catherine. Henry VII also sought to improve relations between England and its northern neighbor, Scotland, by marrying his daughter, Margaret, to the much older King James IV. Unfortunately, there were a few pretenders to the throne. Two of the most famous, Lambert Simnel and Perkin Warbeck, pretended to be members of the York family in order to gain support for a rebellion. The latter actually gained the support of Margaret of Burgundy, Edward IV's sister, and was able to land in England with troops. However, Henry's armies were at the ready and Warbeck was subsequently executed. As mentioned earlier in the episode, Henry VII wed Elizabeth of York, the oldest daughter of Edward IV. Eight months after the wedding, their first child was born. They named him Arthur after the legendary king to symbolize that he was the product of a union that had united the kingdom. Over the years, the couple would have a total of seven children with four reaching adulthood, Arthur, Margaret, Henry, and Mary. Historical accounts indicate that the marriage between Henry and Elizabeth was a happy one. Although it started off as a political alliance, it appears that the two grew to love each other deeply. Henry is one of only a handful of kings to have no known mistresses during his reign. Sadly, in 1502, the Tudor dynasty experienced a devastating blow. On April 2nd, the Prince of Wales, Arthur, died of the sweating sickness. Henry was devastated at the loss of his heir. Less than a year later, he lost his beloved Elizabeth in childbirth. Their newborn daughter died only a few weeks later. Records show that Henry was inconsolable after Elizabeth's death. He would shut himself in his room and not let anyone but his mother come in. However, Henry did remember his kingly duties and understood that he only had one surviving son. So he sent ambassadors to various courts around Europe to help him find a new queen. However, nothing came of these expeditions. Henry would live for about six more years after his wife's death. Records show he became more austere and sad in these later years, which is hardly surprising after the fact that he lost his wife and oldest son. Not long after Elizabeth's death, his oldest daughter was sent to Scotland to marry King James IV. He would never see her again. Henry VII would die of tuberculosis on April 9, 1509. Over the, centuries, Henry has, over the centuries, he has gained a miserly reputation, and while he was fiscally responsible to help rebuild the treasury, recent discoveries and archives show that he often spent large sums on gift for his family and building projects for a family palace. Henry's foreign policies have been praised for their astuteness and helping to put England on the map as a global pair. He was succeeded by his only surviving son, also named Henry. Today, Henry VII is viewed as a strong leader who helped bring peace to England after decades of war. While he isn't the most famous Tudor monarch, he did set the foundation for a fascinating time in English history. Well, that's a wrap on today's episode. Make sure to tune in next time when I talk about the early life of the next Tudor monarch, Henry VIII. Until then, happy listening. Well, that's a wrap on today's episode. Remember to check out the blog post linked in the show notes for images and sources. New episodes come out on Fridays, so make sure to follow at accessible.art.history on Instagram for updates. Until then, happy listening.